How's it going YouTube? This is Levi from Bayfoils and today we have another educational video. In today's video we're going to talk about the different constructions that are used in modern efoils including the construction used in inflatable boards like the new Flightboard Air. There's a lot of misinformation out there on the internet about how these boards are made, how durable they are in comparison to other sort of boards on the market and devices like inflatable inner tubes and whatnot so we're gonna kind of dispel a lot of those myths today before we get into it please subscribe to our videos it costs you nothing we on average get about 95 percent of new viewers to our channel that are not subscribed to our videos so if you like efoil content and want to stay up to date with efoil news tips tricks and also just watch some efoil video wipeouts please consider subscribing to our channel it'll re it really goes a long way to help us out and it costs you nothing so to understand the modern efoil even foil board building process we kind of have to go back in time and look at the early the first foam surfboards and how that technology evolved because that eventually evolved into the technology used in windsurf boards that was used in subsurf boards that is now used in foil boards. So the, the very first foam boards were made from a different kind of foam than what we use today. Uh, it was made from a foam called polyurethane foam that was much cheaper and much more readily available. There's a company called Clark Foam that produced like 90% of the the blanks for the world. Um, and they were huge production until 2005 when they closed down suddenly due to factors. <laughs> but th that is a whole nother video. I'm not going to talk. That's we're not going to. It's not this video today. But basically, polyurethane was the default foam that was used for many years. With, it was used with polyester resin and it was very toxic. When they closed, the, the manufacturers had to use different materials. What we use today, which is EPS foam. Basically, if you've ever seen a block of styrofoam, that's the kind of foam that is in a surfboard. It's called EPS or expanded polystyrene foam. When the manufacturers switched from polyurethane to EPS foam, there was a couple things that they realized they had to kind of change and adapt for modern surfboards. Adapt, improvise, overcome. <laughs> um, and that was how they made the fiberglass layup. So due to the, the difficulties of polyester resin and how it melts a lot of different kinds of materials you use, they vintage surfboard manufacturers were kind of limited with what other materials they can put in the layup which the layup is the fancy term for the the layers of different material that's used in a composite construction back in the day it was really just the foam core and just different layers of fiberglass they called it fiberglass schedule just one or two layers and that was kind of it because that was all you could really do if you try to put a different foam layer in between like the modern foams that we have now it would melt or just cause the polyester resin to catalyze in a weird way it was not really the most awesome thing to do but now that we use epoxy it kind of allowed the manufacturers to start experimenting with different other materials in between the fiberglass layers that add more strength than weight. You can see in the picture behind me, this is kind of a traditional surfboard glassing that's still done to this day, where it's just layers of fiberglass and a foam core with maybe a wood stringer. With a surfboard where we don't need a lot of extra rigidity in places, this is totally fine, but with other disciplines like foiling or stand-up paddleboard, this was uh, just fiberglass layup with epoxy is too weak to mount a boom onto or a foil plate. So it started with the windsurf era when you know you wanted to mount a big wind sail on it, 
but he had a lot of force pulling from that. They wanted to make uh, a fiberglass layup that was more durable than what you could do with just fiberglass. Because otherwise, you would make the board incredibly heavy. And those early windsurf boards were incredibly heavy to withstand the force of that boom. The early you know, pioneers in windsurf construction, they were using full wood composite builds where there was your bottom fiberglass layer and then in between a top layer of fiberglass it was wood like balsa wood that would provide like a, a, a impact resistant layer between the two layers of fiberglass wood is cheap and easy but it's also stupid heavy and so some of these early composite boards were like they were tanks in the literal sense they were indestructible and super heavy Eventually, manufacturers experimented with other different synthetic materials and foams and figured out to use a certain kind of foam called PVC foam. So if you look up PVC foam on Google, you can see that it's, it's a pretty common material. It has very high strength to weight ratio. It's a good insulation material for a lot of different applications, sound insulation, vibration insulation you name it and so it's kind of one of the best things that the surfboard manufacturing has figured out in the past decade is this pvc sandwich design it allows you to make a very lightweight outer shell around your surfboard that's also incredibly impact resistant without being too thick or too heavy so it's it's completely changed how modern high performance boards are made, especially foil boards, stand up paddle boards, and windsurf boards, because you can make your composite withstand those high torque, high force impacts from the boom, from the mast, from your paddle, but still be lighter than old surfboards. It's, it's incredibly versatile. The main drawbacks with PVC foam sandwich construction is the weight. It does add extra weight. So for surfers who really prior prioritize keeping your board super duper lightweight, they don't, you're not going to see PVC sandwich on high performance surfboards, but on stand up, windsurf, foil, all the high performance boards use some sort of sandwich technology. The other drawback is the expense. A PVC sandwich layer adds a lot to the manufacturing process in terms of like days and and just the production cycle and the time is money. So it's considerably more expensive. And so just like other performance industries, carbon fiber is kind of replacing fiberglass in terms of the preferred uh, fabric weave that's used in these composites. It has a higher strength to weight ratio. So when you're really worried about minimizing the weight, that's where carbon fiber comes into play. Behind me is the layup to SIC's Superfly construction, which is their um, high performance carbon composite, carbon sandwich composite that they use on a lot of their paddle boards and foil boards. SIC is one of the manufacturers we sell and has been, you know, they were, they made windsurf boards back in the 80s. They've been a long time uh, manufacturing pioneer for water sport board technology. This layup, kind of one of the most common layups that's out there for high performance boards. You can see on the bottom here, it's fiberglass. We have our PVC sandwich and then on top of it is one or two layers of carbon. Now, this is pretty identical to flight's board construction. I, I think there's only like three factories in the world that have this technology. So I'm willing to bet that flight boards, carbon boards probably come from the same factory that SIC manufactures their boards from. I, again, I can't verify this as fact, but I've opened quite a few flight boards in the time that I've been doing repairs and they have this same kind of layering where there's the core foam, a fiberglass layer, a foam layer, and then a carbon layer. Now we're getting really into the difference between 
the flight board fiberglass and the carbon flight board. The only difference is this outer wrap. On the carbon, it's going to be carbon fiber. On the fiberglass board, it's going to be fiberglass. In terms of durability, the bulk of our durability is coming from that PVC sandwich layer. That's what really provides the impact resistance. The, the real brunt of the force, if you hit something, is going to be dispersed by that PVC sandwich layer, not by the carbon layer. What the carbon does is just reduces the weight. On paper, yes, carbon fiber is 20% stronger than fiberglass. But that's when we're comparing the same amount of material used. In this application, what happens is we actually use less carbon fiber material for the same amount of strength that we would if we were using fiberglass. Carbon in this application is just to reduce our weight. So next time you're looking at a fiberglass board versus a carbon board and you're really trying to weigh the options, think about it in just terms of the weight reduction. That's really what you're paying the extra dollars for and it's you have to justify it to yourself is an extra thousand dollars worth cutting down two three pounds if you're looking to have the most fun and maximize your performance on the water yes if you don't care about surfing or doing crazy stuff or the weight isn't an issue for you then probably not just the weight is really the main reason to use carbon over fiberglass and the difference between the two. Durability wise, they're gonna be very much the same. It's, it's just the weight. That's all you wanna be like looking at. So let's move our focus over to inflatable boards. First thing I wanna go on the record and say is the manufacturing for the flight air is so different from an inflatable boat or uh, inner tube that you would float down the river. It's it's insane to try to draw parallels in terms of your any sort of experience you may have with those other sorts of inflatable watercraft. Like the the only thing an inflatable kayak or inner tube and a f inflatable uh, flight board or paddleboard have in common is the fact that they, you put air into both. But that's where the similarities end. They couldn't be any more different in terms of manufacturing and quality. Like, it's, it's like apples and oranges, man. Completely different things. First and foremost is the material. Boats and inner tubes don't use PVC vinyl, which is the heavy duty rubber that they use on stand-up paddle boards and the flight board air. They use Hypalon or other types of rubber that can't withstand high pressures. And the high pressure is what makes the board feel nice and stiff. These boards you can pump up to 15 PSI. An inner tube or Hypalon boat, you only pump up to like four or six PSI. So we're talking double the air pressure, which makes it much more rigid and feels like a hard board. To really get an understanding on the quality difference between, you know, an inflatable inner tube that you float down the river with and an inflatable uh, the, the flight board air, we really have to look at the inflatable stand-up paddleboard industry because they're who we owe all the technology to. Now, inflatable boards have their own interesting history. They, the technology comes from river raft brands that wanted to make inflatable stand-up boards for the river that then realized, hey, you could sell stand -up, inflatable stand-up boards to basically anybody. Um, and the same kind of struggle that with the glass boards, you know, making sure it's stiff enough to stand on and feel good. So behind me is the first piece of tech that the paddleboard industry figured out to make the board really nice and firm and kind of feel like one cohesive structure. It's this technology called drop stitching, which is where they stitch the top layer and the bottom layer together with these strands of filament. When you fill it full of air, 
these strands connect the top and bottom layers, so it feels like one whole thing. It disperses the weight even your weight evenly, and it just makes it feel really good. This compared to like an inner tube style inflatable where there's no drop stitching, it's a completely night and day difference. If you've never tried a paddleboard before, you should try one because almost every paddleboard in 2024 has drop stitch technology. And that's what separates a paddleboard from an inflatable kayak or other sort of thing. That being said, drop stitching isn't what makes uh, a, a paddleboard good. It's just kind of the, the base requirements to make a paddleboard feel like a board and not like you're standing on an inner tube. What makes a good paddleboard good is the pressure that you could pump it up to. And so the, the material aside, the, the PVC vinyl that they use aside, the other thing that really allows you to put a lot more pressure and make the board a lot stiffer is how you put the board together. Going back to our previous slide here, we can see that the paddleboard is more than just this one layer. Uh, the bladder with the drop stitching in it. We also have another layer, a case, a PVC casing that goes around it that provides extra stiffness and stability and allows you to pump it up to a much higher pressure than just the bladder layer would allow. This allows you to get 15, 16, some paddle boards are even rated up to 20 PSI, which is a lot of pressure which is gonna make it feel very very stiff and rigid the other reason that we're able to pump these boards up to those high pressures and not have to worry about it is because how they glue it together so most inflatable things uh, since the dawn of inflatables were glued um, you know you would take the layers and glue them and then glue it a seal over that you can see in this image here we have our outer rail that goes all the way around the seam between the top and bottom layers so previously glue was used glue is not the best because in due to heat instability and just wear and tear you know if you're rolling up your paddleboard a bunch folding it down sitting it in the sun eventually this glue is going to give and you're going to blow a seam happens all the time we see people buy inexpensive paddle boards they use them for one season next year they try to blow them up or even just one day at the lake and it blows a seam just because it got too hot totally normal with glued construction however in the past five to ten years the the high quality paddleboard manufacturers are are started using a technology that we call fused rails or heat welded rails fusion technology it goes by a bunch of different names but basically what that is is instead of glue they melt the two layers together over the seal so it's not a chemical bonding it's a molecular bonding you're melting the two layers of pvc together so it's one cohesive unit those kind of boards do not just spontaneously blow up from heat or air pressure you know you can leave that board in the sun for the whole day you're at the lake it's not going to blow up or suddenly expand on you or die on you because there's no glue to to disintegrate it's one cohesive unit most quality paddle boards are this fusion technology like if you're spending over $800 on that board it's most likely gonna be heat welded rails and then they also use some sort of reinforcement material whether it's just an extra layer of PVC around the rails just to protect it from impacts but an inflatable board in 2024 is remarkably durable I had one in the Caribbean for six months in the sun every day, eight hours a day, and I had zero issues with deflation or bl blowing in a seam or any sort of issues that you would think of with, uh, you know, some other sort of inflatable and expensive water toy. And it's really fun. Like, I was super impressed with the quality of the new Flight Air 
the way the old ones were designed, how the insert and the bladder were kind of separate, made it really wobbly, especially when you're touching down, was not the best experience. But the new Flight Air being one whole unit, such a better experience. When you touch down, it doesn't like bob all around. It, it feels so much better. And it's at an amazing price. We've already pre-sold three units from viewers on our YouTube channel. So if you are interested in a Flightboard Air, don't hesitate. There are, they are pre-selling like crazy. If you want more information on how to get your how to pre-order your own flight air, regardless of where you live, if you live in the United States, we can get you a pre-order and ship it to you. Buying through us online means no sales tax if you are outside of California, and we provide the same shipping, flat rate shipping, $400 that Flightboard provides anywhere in the country. So please, if you're interested, do not sleep on it. Email us now, info at bayfoils.com, and we can get your name on the list and have one reserved for you. But that's it for this video. Again, please subscribe to our YouTube. Costs you nothing. We really want to grow the channel. If you like these kind of videos, please let us know. Until next time, cheers.